Hello, I'm Frank Detterbeck. I'm a Chief of Thoracic Surgery at Yale University, and we're here to talk about uh, mediastinal staging for non-small cell lung cancer. It's certainly a topic that I've been involved in uh, through my career quite a bit. I'm here with uh, two other experts, Dr. Uh, Lieberman. Hi, Moish Lieberman, University of Montreal, Director of the Shum Endoscopic uh, Tracheobronchial and Esophageal Center. And Dr. Herrera. Hello, I'm Luis Herrera. I'm uh, Section Head Thoracic Surgery in uh, UF Health Cancer Center in Orlando. So this is a, uh, I think, a somewhat complicated uh, topic, and uh, even though it's been discussed uh, quite a bit, I think there's still uh, lots of areas of uh, uh, uncertainty I think that people have in practice and uh, you know a clinical issue that uh, you know we face every day so uh, I would start off maybe by uh, just uh, you know asking you uh, Luis uh, uh, when do you rely on imaging alone for a patient with uh, lung cancer Imaging alone, it depends on the quality of the image, but when we talk about mediastinal staging, we want to look at all the imaging ourselves and the CT scan, uh, look at the adenopathy, the location of the lesion. If it's a primary tumor that we suspect is a T1A or T1B, and we also have a PET CT scan that is a good quality uh, PET CT scan that we can interpret ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, I think that patient with a clinical stage 1A, uh, small primary tumor, peripheral tumor, uh, with a very negative PET scan that I trust, I think that I'm comfortable taking that patient to surgery as I think that the false negative rate on a PET scan like that is probably in the 5 to 10 percent order. Okay. Mosh, what do you think? Other areas where you rely on imaging? Well, I think I agree with uh, Luis in terms of um, relying on imaging, especially for peripheral T1A tumors. And I think to add to that, when you're unsure or you're not 100% sure, there's really no disadvantage in my mind in staging someone who is in that gray area. I would say overstaging is not a bad thing to do, especially if you're doing good staging and you're doing safe staging. Uh, there was a time in some places where everyone was being staged regardless of the uh, size of tumor or CT scan findings and without PET. And in those days, there were still patients who were being found to have microscopic N2 that you didn't know pre-op. Mm -hmm. So I would say overstaging is all right, although for me, again, peripheral uh, T1 tumors, we don't uh, stage if the CT and PET is negative. Mm -hmm. So I guess to sum this up a little bit, I think that um, people that have obvious metastatic disease, we're not going to stage the mediastinum. That's pretty clear. And I think people that have a peripheral stage 1A tumor, we're pretty comfortable on imaging alone, especially if we have a good quality PET. Yes, I would just add that if I have a patient who's a very high risk surgical candidate mm -hmm. who I really don't want to find out I has a uh, upstage tumor at time of BATS or thoracotomy, I will stage the mediastinum in that patient even though the pretest probability is very, very low of having N2 disease only because the operative mor morbidity for that patient is very high. Or someone with bilateral T1 uh, synchronous mm -hmm. primaries, I think it's very worthwhile. I agree. So Louise, what about a CT in a PET scan that's suspicious in the mediastinum. You have no distant metastases, but when do you mm -hmm. say that's good enough? Well, certainly when, when, if, when the CT scan and the PET scan say either one of them are, are abnormal, you could have a negative PET with a slightly enlarged lymph node on a CT scan. I'd rather pursue that lymph node. Uh, there are some less metabolic tumors that can perhaps uh, fool you. So any suspicion in the mediastinum, or even in the hilum, for that matter, uh, on a PET scan on a, on a, or on a CT scan would prompt me to, to stage the mediastinum. Um, if I'm suspicious about uh, finding disease, I'll do this in a separate session outside of my primary operation with endobronchial ultrasound and potentially uh, with a mediastinoscopy if we, we need a confirmatory testing. Mm -hmm. So I also think that there are there are some patients that have what I call uh, infiltrative, you know, infiltration of the mediastinum, where you can't measure a discrete lymph node anymore, where I think we're pretty comfortable just with the imaging alone. 
I think where I'm uncomfortable with the imaging alone is a discrete lymph node that is either enlarged on CT or PET positive. It's these infiltrative masses where I think, you know, probably imaging alone is okay. I, I would agree with that. However, I, I always give the patient the benefit of the doubt. And I think uh, diagnosing N2 or N3 disease, even in a patient who has multiple lymph nodes on PET or CT, gives that patient the benefit of the doubt. And we've been surprised with uh, sarcoidosis, uh, tuberculosis, lymphoma associated with lung cancer. So we always try and stage the mediastinum, unless the patient has brain mets proven positive or liver, we always go for the highest stage, the adrenal, the liver, and also in the era of uh, mutational analysis and molecular markers, we always want to have tissue of good quality and good size from the sort of lead point of the tumor so we can uh, give patients the chance to have uh, molecular therapy if they should be a candidate. Okay. so. Mosh, you have a uh, patient with uh, some enlarged mediastinal nodes, discrete nodes, and they're positive on PET scan, and you just said, uh, you know, you would be inclined to be sure that that really is disease involved. Uh, why, why is that so important? I, I would say that specifically in proximal tumors, in obstructive tumors, we often see positive PET scan lymph nodes or CT scan size-wise positive lymph nodes, and those often or sometimes end up being inflammatory. And I think especially in, in a younger patient, giving the patient the benefit of the doubt to be sure that you've properly staged them rather than sending them to definitive chemoradiation is, is worthwhile. Again, I think that mediastinal staging compared to uh, lobectomy has a much lower morbidity and, and cost, and I think that it's not a major undertaking, especially in 2014, to undergo mediastinal staging. So we always try and give those patients the benefit of the doubt. How, what, what would you say is the uh, false positive rate in general for sort of discrete nodes that are uh, enlarged? I think it would depend on the uh, size and the location of the primary tumor. And I would say that the more post-obstructive atelectasis or pneumonitis that you have, the higher your false positive rate will be. And uh, you know, we don't have good studies or data to show us the actual numbers, but we, we see a good number of those patients coming in with uh, obstruction of the main stem bronchus and multiple nodes or even a lobar bronchus. I would say with a peripheral T1 or T2 tumor, uh, the false positive rate would be much, much less. But because the, even though the pretest probability is very low, because the morbidity and the cost is quite low for staging, I still think it's worthwhile. Okay. I would add to that mm -hmm. that when you see patterns of sarcoidosis where you have contralateral, contralateral hilar disease, which doesn't make as much sense as a, as a mm -hmm. nodal basin, I think you have to sample that mediastinum and not rule that patient out as an N3. It's an atypical pattern, and I mm -hmm. think the sarcoidosis and other mimickers can do that. So I think it's worthwhile pursuing those. Yeah, I think, I guess I would say in my experience, I think that the false positive rate of CT is certainly very high. Right. You know, it's 40% uh, or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. CT enlargement. Oh, I agree. Uh, and I think the false positive rate of PET is uh, probably on the order of 20%. Okay. So that's mm -hmm. kind of one out of five or, you know, mm -hmm. something in that range. Mm -hmm. So um, so let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to the early, you know, earlier patients. So mm -hmm. you have a patient that uh, doesn't uh, have any uh, suspicious areas on CT or PET, uh, but for whatever reason, you think that mediastinal staging is probably important. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do that? What do, what do you, how do you approach that? If I think that that patient is headed towards uh, an operation and the likelihood of a positive PET is very low, uh, for com patient convenience sake uh, and completeness, I would do a mediastinoscopy at the same time of the resection. Uh, alternatively, uh, you could do an endobronchial ultrasound, which uh, we do plenty of uh, at a separate setting. But if, if I have a negative PET and a negative CT scan and a small target, and I still want to do a, a complete staging, I think a combined approach is, is reasonable. 
And which nodes, Lewis, mm -hmm. would you biopsy just for the audience in a stage one right upper lobe T1A okay. tumor? A metastenoscopy, a biopsy for our right paratracheal subcranial level seven, for our left paratracheal, and uh, usually uh, the level twos I, I rarely biopsy uh, unless I see something suspicious. Okay. How would you go about it? Uh, I have to say, in our uh, healthcare system in Canada, it's not really economically. Uh, feasible or uh, cost efficient to do mediastinal staging at the time of or pre-thoracotomy. And we do all of our uh, mediastinal staging preoperatively under local sedation in an endoscopy suite with a combination of EBUS and EUS on all patients. And we will routinely sample N3, N2, and N1 nodes in those patients uh, who are undergoing uh, mediastinal staging. Uh, including for lower lobe tumors, eights, nines, and we always look at the adrenal glands bilaterally in the liver and, and often have found uh, incidental uh, findings within that. Even a celiac axis node in a lower lobe tumor, you can have uh, positive on EUS that you didn't see on PET, which obviously uh, upstages you to a stage four. So we're very aggressive and we uh, biopsy multiple uh, stations on each patient in, in a local sedation uh, setting without general anesthesia. So you're you're talking about a pretty uh, systematic approach and a, a pretty detailed approach where you're really trying to get at multiple areas and make sure that you've really sampled those and, and settled the uh, yeah. the question. And I, I guess you were, Louis, more or less saying the same thing in terms of uh, picking out certain node stations at mediastinoscopy. And of course, there's there's a this, uh, there's a limitation of mediastinoscopy and EBUS and EUS, especially combined. You can reach multiple locations. The, the big question is, uh, how how many patients do you need to do uh, multiple nodal staging to find one uh, 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 occult metastatic deposit on a stage one A patient? And I wonder, uh, you know, is is it worth the time or or the effort to go that far on a, on a negative PET, negative CT scan, early stage tumor. Um, and, and at least in my practice, uh, due to, to be efficient, I, I only do that in selective cases. Yeah, so the way I see it, I think that um, the peripheral stage 1A, like we were talking about before, I think your chance of finding a mediastinal node is less than 10 percent, and um, to me that number is too low to pursue in general at least mediastinal staging. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you have N1 nodes that are suspicious, if you have an enlarged node that is PET negative, you know, you still have about a 20 or 25 percent chance that they're going to have mediastinal node involvement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me, I just think that you can't really make treatment decisions mm -hmm you know, on a patient with a 20 or 25 percent chance that you're going to be wrong. So I guess that's where, you know, I would say, you know, you really need to pursue this. Mm -hmm. I would uh, definitely agree with that. And, I, you know, again, just going back to the way that we staged the mediastinum uh, in patients with lung cancer, we don't necessarily biopsy all of those sites, but we look at all of those sites, and we biopsy a lot of those sites. But we, you know, right upper lobe tumor, uh, T2, let's say a five centimeter tumor in the right upper lobe, and the patient has nothing on CT or PET, and we do our EBUS, EUS, and the 4L lymph node is three millimeters, we will often biopsy it, but that's more of a training thing for residents and fellows. I don't think you necessarily need to, to go after that every time. Uh, but I think looking at all the stations, you'd be surprised on ultrasound how lymph nodes are, are much more present than on CT, and sometimes they're bigger. Uh, uh, than they, they look like uh, on pre-op imaging, and uh, you can be surprised. So I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile. I would say that with an aggressive mediastinal staging program, which I think most of us are doing uh, f for the non-T1A, I haven't operated on a patient with occult N2 or surprise N2 in the last three years. And I think that's a very good thing for patients. I, I actually, f f I used to feel very badly when I would do a lobectomy or go in to do a lobectomy and find out that the patient had N2 disease. And I think that we shouldn't be doing that anymore. I don't think that there's an acceptable rate of of incidentally found N2 nodes. We're all going to have it once in a while. But if that rate is 5 or 10%, I think it's too high, especially nowadays when CT, PET, and, and 
mediastinoscopy, EBC, whatever technique you're doing, as long as you're doing it well, you should really have a low uh, surprise N2 rate. So we were talking earlier, uh, you know, you were talking about mediastinoscopy, you were talking a little bit more about EBUS and EUS. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, which of those should one do. Mm -hmm. Are you arguing for mediastinoscopy versus mm -hmm. uh, EBUS? No. Or, uh, I, think, I think we as, uh, as thoracic surgeons and thoracic oncologists, we need to offer both, and I offer both. And uh, what you need to know within your practice is how, how is your own quality with endobronchial ultrasound. Just because you do endobronchial ultrasound doesn't mean that you're you cannot assume that your sensitivity and specificity matches that of the literature. So you have to look at your own results, especially in your learning curve, and make mm -hmm. sure that you're uh, uh, accurate. And I agree with what you said in, in your conference, in your talk, where uh, you look at your first 50, 100 cases and you make sure your correlation is there. And, and I did that at the beginning, and we've done over 600 EBUSes now, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, uh, I'm pretty comfortable, and I think it is an alternative to a mediastinoscopy. I don't feel I'm missing out mm -hmm. on a mediastinoscopy. However, um, there are situations where you, you, the other thing I recommend is go down to the pathologist or with the pathologist and look at your sample not, uh, and ask for it that it's just blood and mm -hmm. bronchial cells. It's not, and you're still concerned, uh, and you cannot get to that node for whatever reason. Uh, be prepared to do a mediastinoscopy or do that at a different setting. Okay, so you're uh, arguing that it's not so much which test you do, but it's the quality and thoroughness with which you do it Correct. that is important. Mm -hmm. And also saying that, you know, to really do a good job, you ought to know kind of what your results are and That's be right. able to uh, um, be confident that you're actually getting an accurate result. Correct. Osh, what do you... I think I, ag I agree with that. I, I look at uh, mediastinal staging the same way as I look at lobectomy or esophagectomy. I think that if you're doing a good job and it's reliably good with low morbidity and good outcomes, you're, you're doing the correct test in your hands. And I think that uh, a robotic lobectomy or a vast lobectomy or a lobectomy by thoracotomy all have their role. And if you do each one of those well, then that's fine for you. And I would say it's the same thing for EBUS, EUS, and mediastinoscopy. I think that there is a lot of very bad mediastinoscopy going on, and there's a lot of bad EBUS and EUS going on. So if you have one of those techniques or more than one that you do well, I would say you can continue with that. I don't think any of those are bad. The only caveat to that is that I find that mediastinoscopy, even though we call it the gold standard, is an imperfect test. It's mm -hmm. really not, in my mind, the gold. It's the gold standard because it's old, and we did it for many years, but it's not the gold standard because it's better. Mm -hmm. The actual limitations to mediastinoscopy, at least conventional mediastinoscopy, without talking about more advanced mediastinal uh, uh, staging techniques through the neck, uh, only can get you in the paratracheal and subcranial area. Whereas with these newer technologies, we have the ability to go into the hilum, which is important for, for biopsy of N1 nodes for markers, and also down in the eights, nines, and, and in the abdomen. Whereas with mediastinoscopy, we never had that ability. So I would say, at least in, in our experience, and we've prospectively looked at, at this, uh, comparing mediastinoscopy to EBUS EUS, we actually have much better results with EBUS EUS mm -hmm. and lower uh, mm -hmm. false positive rates at uh, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. false negative rates at, at thoracotomy. Mm -hmm. Well, I do think, though, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of focus on uh, EBUS and EUS, and these are clearly, uh, you know, great techniques that I think have changed, uh, you know, a lot of how we approach uh, patients. On the other hand, you know, I also think mediastinoscopy has advanced, and I think that, uh, you know, the techniques that you need to have to do a good quality mediastinoscopy are not always taught well, you know, and I think that with video mediastinoscopy, you can see so much better, you can do a complete mediastinal lymphadenectomy if you want, um, you know, that's much different than an old-fashioned mediastinoscopy where you just put a light down in the mediastinum and if you saw something and it jumped out at you, you biopsied it. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that, and I think that uh, we, we discussed this before, Frank, but I think that the 
American College of Surgeons paper from uh, 2000 or 2001 showing that 50% of mediastinoscopies in North America had no lymph node biopsies. I think that's a very accurate, uh, I, I believe those results 100%. And I think that's the, that would be the exact same if we did an American College of Surgeons uh, survey on EBIS. I think it would be the exact same, that there's a lot of EBIS being done without any lymph node biopsy or biopsy of lymph node with lymphocytes actually in the specimen. And so if you do something well, whether it's MEAD or EBUS or EUS or whatever, I think that's fine. And I think that uh, mediastinoscopy has advanced, but unfortunately, a lot of people are doing very, very bad mediastinoscopy. And I would say a bad EBUS is less dangerous to a patient than a bad mediastinoscopy. So, Luis, what do you think is a bad EBUS? A bad EBUS to me is uh, an EBUS that samples only one or two stations doesn't sample at least three stations. Uh, one that the specimen, like uh, Moshe said, is, is uh, lacks lymphocytes or, or you know, obviously any pathologic mm -hmm. diagnosis. So um, I, I think that does it need to include the hilum? Uh, I think it depends. Uh, I think uh, if it's not going to change the clinical course of the patient, I don't think you have to biopsy the level 11s or or 12s, but, uh, but I think it's more of a sampling mm -hmm. minimum mm -hmm. stations in the quality. I, I would say, uh, to add to that, that uh, poorly done EBUS is actually more dangerous than a poorly done MEAD, and not dangerous in terms of morbidity for the patient, but uh, dangerous in terms of uh, upstaging that patient. And I would say that it, in the literature, every paper you look at on EBIS or US says there's no such thing as a false positive rate on EBIS or US, and that is completely false. I have seen two patients in the last six months that have had false positive results on EBIS done outside, and it's not because the pathologist thought a lymphocyte was a cancer cell, it's because the wrong station was biopsied and mislabeled. And I think that bad EBIS in the U.S. is very dangerous. And patients, you know, 10R and 4R are very close. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure, uh, you, you're better off to biopsy no nodes than mm -hmm. to biopsy the wrong node and label it. And I saw two patients who were biopsy what I think is 10R, and then it was in, and the, uh, ended up being having a redo EBIS in U.S. In, in our center. The 4R was negative. Both patients went to thoracoscopy, and the 4R was negative. Those patients were sent for definitive chemo radiation and happened to somehow know somebody and get in to have mm -hmm. restaging. But I would say that probably is going on a lot, and that's very, very scary. I would say in mediastinoscopy, uh, it's very hard to do that because most people doing traditional mediastinoscopy are not passing the azagous vein. So you're, you're keeping or you're selecting a safer uh, 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 test in that way. So I think false positive on EBIS US occurs, and, and it's very dangerous for patients. Mm -hmm. So I guess what we're saying is that uh, it's key to really know what you're dealing with when you're trying to make a treatment decision about a patient. So you really have to uh, assess the mediastinum well in a lot of situations. We defined a few where imaging is okay, but in a lot of situations we really need to define that. Mm -hmm. And then it's important to focus on this and to make sure that you do it with good quality, uh, biopsy nodes adequately, mm -hmm maybe know what your results are, and also to sort of know the anatomy well and be able to not mislabel things and to uh, do a good job. And I guess the last thing we're saying is that uh, if there is a question, if the results are a little bit discordant and uh, don't seem to quite fit to make sense, that probably one should go another step and sort of relook at that with a second procedure or, or something else to confirm the results mm -hmm. because it's so important to really know what the stage of the patient is when you are making treatment decisions. I would agree with that. And I would say that the, the scariest part of that whole discussion that we had is that mediastinal staging, in my opinion, is moving away from the thoracic surgical realm and moving into the pulmonology realm. And we may not have the chance in, in a lot of these patients to do that second procedure, whether it's another EBIS, EUS, or a MEAD, because that patient may come through pulmonary, may have a bad mediastinal staging procedure with mislabeled nodes and be sent directly to medical and radiation oncology. And that is why I think we need, as thoracic surgeons, to stay heavily involved in mediastinal staging and the complete care of the uh, patient with non-small cell lung cancer.
Well, I also think, though, that uh, care of lung cancer is a team approach, and I think that we work best as a team, and, uh, uh, you know, we have interventional path uh, pulmonologists, actually, that are part of our group uh, that do actually a lot of our EBUS, but, you know, we work as a team, and so we discuss things and do this together. So I think that... Uh, I would agree uh, with that. I think in, in a large volume academic center, you know, similar to, to the, the way we work, that's ideal. And I think that's what everyone wants is a team approach with not only pulmonary, but medical oncology, radiation oncology, GI, thoracic working together. But I think for the for the thoracic surgeon working in a small community hospital who may not have interventional pulmonary, may not have a team, and may be seeing patients referred from outside for surgery, there, that's where the danger will be, I think, in, in my mind, in missing uh, correct intestinal staging for those mm -hmm. patients. But I think the ideal would be a team approach, and that's for sure, if you can have it. Okay. Well, I uh, thank you for coming and, uh, you know, sharing your thoughts about this. I think this was an interesting okay. discussion. and. Uh, Nice to nice to uh, chat with you. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Frank. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you.